Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Broby, and I'd like to welcome you to our ICIP Nigeria fifth webinar. This is the fifth webinar in the knowledge series being done by ICIP Nigeria, and we're so privileged that you can all be with us today. Um, a brief description of ICIP. ICIP is a membership organization of drug demand reduction professionals within the area of treatment, prevention, and recovery. And you can learn more about our organization on our website, which is www.icip.net, where you can join and become a member of ICIP and be able to learn more about the work that we're doing. And as part of ICIP, we have our national chapters. Now, the national chapters are ICIP on the national level. And ICIP Nigeria is our national chapter in Nigeria, working with our partners on the ground and also with um, local entities, along with the, the government in Nigeria. So we're so pleased that ICIP Nigeria can organize this webinar for us based on the areas which ICIP is passionate about. So I would like to hand over the time now to the ICIP Nigeria president, Martin, and he will welcome the participants and also give a brief introduction to our speaker today. Over to you now, Martin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today at the fifth session of ISOP Nigerian Chapter by monthly webinar, tagged ISOP Nigerian Knowledge Update Series. Our speaker for today is uh, Mr. Peter Adeni uh, He will be leading us in a discussion on the topic recovery in substance use disorders, the family as a resource. So I could join me in moderating this session is Michael. Mr. Adeni is a clinical social worker with over 15 years of experience in the treatment and rehabilitation of clients with substance use disorders. He is the unit head of clinical social worker at Drug Demand Reduction Unit of the Federal Neuropsychiatric Hospital here by Lagos State, Nigeria. He is a founder of Patient uh, Parents and Therapist Forum. Also, the Chief Executive Officer of Gift of Love Mutual Support Group. Uh, he is a national trainer on the Universal Treatment Curriculum and an international certified addiction professional. He has presented papers at local and international conferences, including ISOP Global Conference in Nairobi, Kenya in 2018. And in the, at the International Consortium of Universities for Drug Demand Reduction Conference in Peru, that was 2019. Uh, he's a member of the National Executive Council of ISOP Nigerian Chapter. Uh, before I invite the speaker, uh, please remember to use the chat box for your questions as he present, as he makes his presentation. So at this point, please join me to welcome uh, Mr. Adeni Boyan for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martins, the president. Um, I want to, I would like to thank the ISOP Global for this great opportunity given to us in Nigeria to share with other members of the world. We thank the president and executive members of um, Ice of Nigeria for this privilege. Um, quickly, today we'll be looking at recovery in substance use disorders, the family as a source. Uh, in the course of this presentation, this presentation, we are going to look at the, the, In course of this presentation, sorry for that. In course of this presentation, we're going to learn about recovery capital for lab prevention. And we are going to learn how to offer an inclusive program involving families. They were able to identify some barriers that might militate against recovery and what are the possible solutions we have. Then we also learn how to handle affiliate stigma issues. So looking at the definition of terms, the psychoactive substance 
is one of the key factors there that we have to take notice of. It's a chemical substance that changes nervous system function and at the same time, alter the perception, the mood, the consciousness, the cognition and behavior of the user. So before it gets to addiction, we have use, misuse, abuse and dependency before it gets to addiction. So what is substance addiction? It's a chronic relapsing brain disease characterized by compulsive drug seeking and use despite harmful consequences. What makes it a chronic? Because it's a long lasting and that cannot be cured but can be managed. And this is as a result of lapse and relapse. So when we talk about lapse, it's a brief one, one off time return to drug, whereas relapse is a complete return to using psychotic substances in the same way the person did before he or she quits. Today, we are looking at recovery. And looking at recovery, that's need for us to be able to understand what recovery is all about. So recovery from alcohol and drug problem is a process of change through which an individual achieves abstinence and improved health, wellness, and quality of life. Now, we're looking at recovery capital. What are the things that will help these patients able to do, well, to, do, to do well and recover well? So we're looking at recovery capital. So this is what we can refer to as a comprehensive total or the sum personal and social assets or resources at client's disposal for addressing drug dependency. And at the same time, some of those things that we need as a support, you know, to support his capacity and also to bring about opportunity for recovery. All the things that this patient has around him will enable him to, to achieve the recovery. So recovery can become successful or fail, and it will depend on the quality and the quantity of personal, uh, the, that, that client's uh, recovery capital. UNODC, they identify eight domains of recovery management. And I can use Abraham, um, Arab hierarchy of needs, you know, looking at from the first one till we get to the peak one. So the first one is to look at the physical and mental health of this client. Then the family, the social support and leisure activities of this patient. These are the things that can also aid uh, recovery. Then safe housing and handy environment, peer-based support, that's mutual support group, employment and legal resolution. What about the skill, the vocational and educational skill of these patients? What about integration back into the community and cultural support and rediscovering the meaning and purpose in life? So looking at another way of recovery capital, which was propounded by W.L. White, it propounded three ways of uh, recovery capital that can aid recovery. The first one, you look at the personal. And under this personal, we have physical recovery capital, and we also have human recovery capital. Under the, uh, the physical recovery capital, we have physical health of, your, of this client, the financial assets. Is there any safe and conducive shelter for this patient or for this client? And the environment, is it conducive? What about the basic need, the food, the clothing, and the employment for this patient? What about access to transportation? All these are under physical recovery capital. Then looking at human recovery capital, what about the skill? Does he have educational skill or vocational skill? Is this patient, is it employable? Does he have values? What about the perception about the past, present, and future? Has he been able to put them in the right perspective? What about problem solving skill? Self-efficacy of this patient is also important. So they're able to handle and manage some high risk situation. Now we're talking about family as a resource. Family generally refers to persons who are biologically or psychologically related with historical, emotional, or economic bonds and perceive themselves as part of the household. Family is a unit of every society. Family is also a system. That is to say, whatever affects one family member will also affect other family members. Substance use can affect other non-substance use family members, and that this can lead to dysfunction. On the other hand, family dysfunction as well can lead to substance use problems in one or more members of the family. Then the question now is, why is it that family is, it can be said to be a, 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 a resource for recovery capital? If the, the immediate, a, a, a intimate partner, if they are willing to participate in treatment, it is going to help the patient to do well. The presence of significant others, the dad, probably the dad smokes, the mommy also drinks, 
once they know that these people are also in treatment, it's going to help in recovery. What about having some connection and have access to some institutions like school, workplace, place of worship, or community organization that can also help, is going to also help in recovery. Then access to opportunities for recovery-based um, groups and um, fellowship or leisure activities, this can also help in recovery. In a community, if you have active efforts, if there's active efforts to reduce stigma, it's going to also help a lot in the recovery capital for our patients. Is there any continuum of addiction treatment services in a community? If you have, yes, it's going to really help. But if you don't have, then it might also militate against um, recovery. What about availability of treatment centers, recovery homes, and recovery ministry? Do we have them in our community? If you have them, definitely it's going to help and it's going to serve as a recovery capital. What about mutual support group for our clients, especially when we talk about do they have assets? Do they have access? Uh, all those groups like 12 step, are they accessible? Can they have access to that? Can they, can, can they be part of it? So if they can, then it's going to help in recovery. What about sources of sustaining recovery, support, and if there's any relapse, any intervention can also help to prevent a relapse. So the question now is, why do we need to involve family in recovery? In substance use disorder treatment, when you involve the family, it's going to increase treatment engagement. At the same time, it's going to decrease dropout rates. And definitely, we're going to have a better and long-term outcomes. When families are involved in treatment, the focus now change from individual now to a larger society, uh, to larger family members. Hello, Michael. Hi, I'm here. Peter, can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, Peter, can you hear me? I'm going to prepare uh, the family to what to expect in early recovery, not to have unrealistic expectation. Many patient relations were confused initially at the intake level. You no, know, we don't know what to do. What are we going to do? What should be our role? So, but if you involve them in the treatment, then we're able to prepare their minds about what they should expect and they will not have unrealistic expectation. Then when we involve family members in treatment, we're able to educate the family member about relapse warning signs, and in turn, it will also help them to prevent a relapse. Then involving them will enable us to identify some family conflicts or enabling behavior that might work against um, recovery. It will enable family to see the need to make the necessary changes in their lives and take responsibility for their emotional, physical, and spiritual recovery. It's going to also help family members to understand and change their dysfunctional behavior pattern, which is going to really help. Then what are the programs that we have that we can use to involve the family? The first one we have, BCT, which we refer to as behavioral couple therapy. This one is mainly for the couple. We also have multi-systemic multi therapy, that's MST. This one is basically for the adolescents. We also have multidimensional family therapy, MDFT, for adolescents. We also have brief strategy family therapy for adolescents. But today we are going to look at one that is encompassing that both adolescents, the adult male and female, can also be part of it. And that is Parents, Patient, and Therapist Forum, PPTF. So this PPTF was formed in 2009 and with the purpose of bringing together the mental health provider and mental health consumer to interact on the possible prevention, causes, relapse, prevention, treatment, and even the recovery modality. There's going to be a benefit to everybody. If you look at this diagram, we have the patient, we have the parent, we have the therapist. You can see the hero interaction between the patient and the therapist, and we have interaction between the patient and the parent, and the parents as well, they're also interacting with, uh, with the therapist. So it's a triadic form. And if you also look at the model, of treatment, biopsychosocial. So we look at the biology, we look at the social, we also look at the, 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 the psychological aspect of it. So looking at this as well, it's going to enable everybody to interact and to be able to know each other. So PPT here focuses on the parents of the client, 
the siblings, even they have siblings, the patient itself, which is the key actor in this um, treatment, then the therapist, which made up of doctors, psychologists, counselors, social workers, who are also contributing in making sure that this patient is well. So, so this PPT have also provide a supportive environment for family to interact and discuss common concerns and problems. So it also provides psychoeducation sessions, which is going to focus in or focusing on educating family members about addiction, its impact on family, recovery, and relapse. And this is done in non-threatening environments, whereby the members of the family understand the problem of addiction and they also learn coping strategies from observing others in the similar who are also having some uh, in a similar situation. Permit me to share with you some of the topics that we, we treat during the PPT here. We talk about how substance use disorder affects the whole family, methods to rebuild relationship and develop trust. Because at that point in time, the relations will have lost trust in the client because we believe that uh, the drug uh, people that use drugs, you know, they, 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 they tell lies a lot. So we are during that period, we also use defining and redefining family roles and rules. You know, it's part of the, 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 the lectures. The kind of support the family can provide towards recovery. Then what about communication? Strengthening communication and at the same time promoting self-care by the patient. So what are the outcome of PPT here? Over the time, we have seen that intimate partners and the family members now they are now participating, they are willing to participate in treatment. Patients are now adhering to their medications. Even if they forget to take it, the relations will remind them, oh, Uncle Ross. My husband, my wife, don't forget your medication or I take your medication. So there is a, what we refer to as medication adherence. That's a reduction of waiting time during the clinic because the therapist, the doctor, the social worker, the, the, the psychologist, they, they have appointment with these patients. So there's no need for keeping them with. They have an appointment. Once they come around, they attend to them so that they can go. So there's a reduction in waiting time. Then keeping to follow up programs because we have involved the relations and the family members, they can easily um, remind themselves about the the the, the follow-up program it's also really stigma because they know that i'm not the only one suffering other members of the other people also uh, in the society that are also having the same issues so there's a full continuum of additional treatment services whereby after we have discharged them from the hospital we still want them to come around and know how they are faring and if there is any uh, need we also give them some bit of psycho education with all these there's a lot of barriers as well Marital separation. If daddy and mommy are separated, they're not living together. Then it's going to affect the children. I remember many years ago when we invited uh, a, a father and a mother to come around for, for to corroborate information. And in the course of talking, argument ensue, and the father was about to be the mother because of little argument. So fear of violence might also not make member of the family to participate. Even some family also view substance use disorder as a medical problem that it has nothing to do with the family. Some people also believe that. The treatment cannot work. Some people, some people, some family also believe that treatment, uh, participation, participation in treatment is often wrongly interpreted by, by saying that the family is being blamed for substance use disorders problems. What about social stigma and shame that related to this? What about sudden deaths of a spouse or, or a relation or a father or a mother? It can also militate against recovery. Apart from all this, we don't have enough personnel who have evidence-based knowledge on substance use disorder prevention and treatment. There are a lot of insufficient capacity, you know, treatment center to, to treat or to handle the case of substance use disorders. Inadequate funding for training of personnel. And even if you have some patients who are motivated, they want to come for treatment, but they can't afford it. What about lack of continuity in treatment services, which is more than a continuum of care, which is paramount, which is very important in treatment in recovery. What about lack of mental health services to provide integrated services to handle co occurring issues when we have patients who have mental illness, also have substance use disorder? Those are the two issues at the same time, and they're different treatments. Mental health is different from substance use disorder. So there should be integrated services to provide all this for our, for our people. We don't normally we don't even have that in some places. Transportation can also be a, like a barrier in rural areas, especially right now. In developing country, the gas price is continuing to, to rise. So, looking at affluent stigma, affluent stigma. This is what we can refer to as internalization of associative stigma by family members, because drug use is a highly stigmatized behavior, 
and it's a highly, it's mainly viewed as some people look at it as a controllable behavior or weakness of character, rather than they should be able to see it as a disease. When you look at stigma, it can be said as a mark of disgrace, devaluation that sets an individual and family apart from others. It comes with guilt, helplessness, hunger, sadness, frustration, isolation, anxiety, worry, shame, stress, and some also don't believe that there's no future for this for these people. So looking at what Coringa said in 2006, he replied that family, families of drug-dependent individuals were the most stigmatized and actually judged, blameworthy for the onset of the disorder, or relapse into drug use and contaminated by their family members' drug use. So there's evidence that family members of individuals with chronic condition internalize family stigma in the same way that individuals oftentimes internalize public stigma. So family who still be struggling you know, having difficulty relating to, led to extreme stress, anxiety, distrust, deterioration, uh, deteriorating relationship, feeling of powerlessness and codependency. So families are going through all this, but what do we, what do we advise? What, 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 what's our opinion? What's our expert opinion to tell this family member? The first one is for them to speak out. As they are learning about addition, as we're learning about treatment, recovery, that's likely for them to be able to notice some misinformation and adverse effect of stigma on them. So we encourage them to speak out. They should be able to challenge inaccuracy, educate others, and guide them to authoritative source of um, information. So we always tell them, speak, don't be kept quiet, tell people the right thing. So they should not define people by their disorders. People, um, people are more than their health problems. So addition does not describe what a person is. Whereas addiction describes what a person has. So defining people exclusive by the addiction, diminishing the revival, the wholeness of that, that lives. So we are calling people not to say the addicts, rather, we are calling them to say people with addiction. So there's no need to sensationalize um, addiction. Although we know that um, the, the addiction comes with uh, uh, dramatic uh, experiences and what have you. But we should stop saying this person is suffering or suffer from afflicted with or is a victim of addiction rather we should be able to say it has a substance use disorder or people with addiction that's it for us to continue to educate the general public that recovery is a dynamic and in a multiple phase process in which success is measured through improvements in multiple biopsychosocial model or domain and that these improvements are often implemented it's a stage from simple to complex then they should be, so we also emphasize that relapse does not represent treatment failure. Doesn't mean that, that a client has failed when the client has failed or the treatment program also has failed. So, but rather we, we let them see that relapse is being considered as an opportunity to examine and re-examine an individual recovery program and areas where it needs to be strengthened. So this and gentlemen in conclusion, the role of family in recovery of substance use disorder cannot be overemphasized. So for better treatment, prevention, and recovery of an individual with substance use disorder, the family involvement in treatment enhances better treatment outcome. So I want to say today that there's need for all of us globally to join our hands together. And if we all join our hands together, the families of people who use substances to be free of affiliate stigma and be able to curb the menace of this substance use disorder in our society. Thank you. That's my references. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, for that uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, participants will agree with me that uh, uh, Peter spoke so well on this. Uh, so I want to encourage uh, participants who have questions to begin to at least uh, draw our attention to areas that you would want uh, Peter to, to clarify or to uh, uh, add, you know, uh, some points. Uh, we need uh, more, more information in some areas. But briefly, a part of what uh, Peter has made us to, to understand is that uh, uh, looking at uh, the UNODC domains of uh, uh, recovery management, uh, there are certain things that we need to pay uh, special attention to, and uh, it is part of the comprehensive treatment 
uh, for persons with substance use uh, disorder. So uh, this, I must say, is very important. And uh, one of these aspects, the domains, uh, include the family, the family as a resource, the family as a resource. And uh, the speakers spoke so well on, on the need to involve family in the uh, as part of uh, recovery. And he identified factors within the family uh, that can support uh, a recovery, as well as other settings in that, that should ordinarily be involved, you know, for uh, as part of a comprehensive uh, uh, recovery. So the speaker also spoke about why family need to be involved, more of the, the, the significance or the importance of family uh, involvement uh, in patient uh, management. And um, he identified uh, the risk factors to relapse, if we want to put it that way, or factors that, uh, that, that uh, more or less uh, allow relapse to, 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 to occur in the first place. You know, beyond treatment, one thing is a uh, recovery period. And that recovery period, uh, the tendency is that if certain things are not put in place, uh, uh, the person in recovery may eventually uh, go back to the use of psychoactive substances. So he was able to identify these uh, uh, factors, you know, that could lead to, uh, to, to relapse. And uh, again, he identified barriers to treatment, you know, talking of recovery now, and also barriers to treatment. And uh, you will agree with me that uh, uh, when treatment is not, uh, is not comprehensive or not properly uh, provided, or uh, the, the different factors that ordinarily should be put into consideration during treatment, if they are not put into consideration or put in place, it will also at least uh, a little uh, uh, relapse, you know. So, and uh, these are some of the things that, uh, in summary, that Peter have also made us to to understand and above all, he called for uh, collaborative efforts among stakeholders uh, to be involved in, in the treatment of persons with substance use disorders, uh, also to, to, to prevent uh, relapse. So uh, quickly, let's look at the question box. If there are questions there that uh, will need uh, our attention. Uh, Michael? Thank you, Martin. Yes, there are some questions. <laughs> received from participants and uh, I'll start off with the first one I'll share that with you now so the first question to you Peter is okay. what contribution are you doing to reduce the menace of substance abuse in northern Nigeria where drug and substance abuse is killing our society um, and this is in relation to the way Euphoda, um, that's an organization, it's an acronym, it stands for Youth Awareness Forum on Drug Abuse. Um, so what they are doing to reduce um, substance abuse. So what contribution are you doing to reduce the menace of substance abuse in northern Nigeria, um, similar to what is being done by Youth Awareness Forum on Drug Abuse? So that's the question, Peter. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for that brilliant um, question. Um, we started by going to schools, going to churches, and um, talk to the youth, especially in the churches, about the consequences of using uh, psychoactive substances. And um, we are enlightening them about, for them to be able to get to know that curiosity, um, peer influence or peer pressure can trigger or can make them to go into substance intake. So we be going to churches, going to schools uh, to talk to people about what can be the consequences of um, uh, or the implication of using psychoactive substances. And at times we use biopsychosocial model that what are the biological implication, what are the things that will result, or what are the things after taking the psychoactive substances, what is going to, how is it going to affect their body, that's their, 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 their physical body or internal organs, then does it have anything to do with their mind, is it going to affect their mind, and does it, does it have any social implications about 
the people they are living with their families and other people around them. So we give it as a form of psychoeducation to them. So that's what we have been doing in our own little way here. But we also promise to do better and do better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for, for that wonderful answer. I'll go on to the next question we've received from our participants. And the question is... Okay. Sorry, sorry, my, uh, sorry Michael, to just add to uh, the response of uh, Peter. Uh, and I want to also appreciate the, the, the colleague or the participant who raised that, that question. Uh, even though the presentation is more of uh, uh, um, support during uh, recovery, uh, but Peter has also been able to uh, talk about uh, the prevention activities that are going on. Uh, let me add that uh, ISOP is also uh, uh, doing uh, something as far as uh, prevention is concerned, uh, collaborating with different stakeholders uh, to, to prevent you know, using uh, different uh, strategies, including capacity building. So uh, that I uh, will also hope that uh, the colleague that asked the question uh, we will see how we can collaborate to see that uh, uh, first we we'll build capacity because uh, uh, the truth about it is that it's high level of ignorance when it comes to substance use issues and disorders and uh, uh, first thing I believe should, that should be done is also to build the capacity of practitioners so as, so as to have uh, the, the, the scientific uh, knowledge background to provide what is more effective and that is evidence-based uh, interventions. Thank you. So, Michael. Thank you, Martin, for your comments there, especially as I know I said Nigeria is very much involved um, within prevention, treatment, and recovery, which Peter's just done a wonderful presentation. I'll go on to the next question. The next question is, um, please, how do you handle family that do not uh, make themselves available for sessions and parent and, and patient care? So the question is, how do you um, handle families who do not make themselves available for sessions and patient care? And that's the next question, Peter. Well, as I rightly pointed out, that um, there are some patient relations that uh, they have this kind of fear of violence, you know, and uh, they look at that as kind of a barrier for not participating. So what we do is that if you if you recognize or we realize that both of them cannot be together at the same time. We have a separate section for them. And what we also do is to meet with these relations and allay their fear, that's safe. There's nothing wrong in you participating. There's nothing wrong in you helping your child in recovery. Because the problem is that the reason why some of them also refuse to come is the body of care. The body of care is too much on the carer in the sense that they have been having this issue of relapse over a period of time and many of these relations have fed up and they just or less like mm. see i've wasted a lot of time i've wasted a lot of resources in, the, in going to treatment center looking for help here and there even before they get to the hospital they will spend a lot of money in churches in the traditional list before they will now resolve back to using the orthodox uh, uh, ways of doing things so looking at that, there's need for us also to psychoeducate them, encourage them, try to pet them that see, if you are also involved, it's going to help your child to do well. So handling families that are more or less like they're not making themselves available, we're not just going to fold our hands and say, well, because they are not coming, then there's nothing we can do. We we'll reach out to them, we we'll talk to them one on one. If we invite them, they didn't come, we we'll go and meet them as a social worker go to their homes and talk to them about what they should do because it's a tragic thing the relation has a, 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 a part to play the the, the the therapist we also have a role to play the patient also all of us we have a role to play that's why i said it's a tragic form so by the time we educate them on this then some of them might change their mind and um, also come up for for discussion or for treatment thank you Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, Martin, do you have any comments or anything to, to add to that, Martin? Uh, not for now. Okay, thank no, you. Michael. Okay, thank you, Martin. I'll move on to the next question. So the next question is, what happens um, to a client abandoned by the family? Serious challenges in the family 
at this crucial period. So the question again is what happens if a client abandoned by the family, serious challenges in the family at this crucial period? Well, we, we have a lot of experiences apart, um, concerning abandoned patients. And when we talk about abandoned patients is because um, relations will come around with the pretense that they are ready to engage and to support these patients in the, the course of the treatment. And after a while, you discover that their phone will be switched off. You will be able to get them on phone again. Number two, if you also try to trace where they, where they stay the address, at times you may not even find them in that place, but they will locate to another place. So these are the things we can refer to as that patient has been abandoned. You know, and what do we do at that point in time is that we are not going to give up. We are not going to give up about those patients. We also look for philanthropists, people who can also help, you know, to maintain and to sustain their treatment. So that if all those people are already there and we have resources that we can also, uh, resources that we also use to help this patient. But most of the time, we still encourage relations that we need to abandon this patient. This patient is bad today, but it doesn't mean that this patient will not be better tomorrow. But the fact that this patient is going through this kind of situation doesn't mean that that's, it. that's the end of his life. So we encourage them and we also help them. But eventually, if we couldn't get relations, then we refer the patient or the, the, the case to the management and they will look at, at it critically. Then at the management level, they can also take a decision whether they look for a way of helping the patient, integrate the patient back to the society. And when the patient is doing well, the patients will to the office, to the form of board, say, ah, sorry, we went so so place, different kind of excuses. Whereas somebody has taken their role in helping them to help the patient. So when we have patient has been abandoned, we, we too, as a therapist also, we don't abandon them. We take up their cases, we take up their challenges, and we see how best we can help them. In our, in our facility here in Yerba Lagos, we have what we call Alan, then we also have what we call friend of hospitals. So they also come on board to also help some of our patients who cannot pay for their medications, who cannot you know, get one thing or the other. So um, the issue of abandoned patients is rampant, but at the same time, we have a way of coping and helping them. Thank you. Thank you very much, and Peter, for that wonderful answer. Martin, any comments from you? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I think one thing we should also do, uh, especially from the professional point of view, uh, is to at least reorientate uh, uh, the, the, the public about uh, uh, the perception about substance use issues, because uh, uh, they see it as more of a moral failure and uh, the persons who use uh, drugs uh, on the path of self-destroy as such, uh, they should just uh, be left alone to do so. And that makes uh, family members and even the society to delay paying attention at early stage. And at the time they are seeking for help, it possibly would have degenerated and uh, almost getting too late. And that is where you see cases of uh, abandonment because uh, uh, other issues would have come in that the parents possibly are not able to contend with all they're looking for is where to just keep uh, the patient and, and, and so as to have peace and so on. So uh, or, uh, orientation, you know, uh, about or change in the perception of the problem of substance use issues, uh, not to say it as, as moral failure. We also help uh, family members and the society to pay attention early enough where uh, they, will not, they, will, they will not see the patient as already a burden in order to be abandoned. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for your um, excellent contribution there. With the next question, i move on to that one. And the question is, what can we do to help a patient that has um, basically gone through a comprehensive strategy but continues to relapse. So what can we do to, to help a patient when we've been put we've put them through a comprehensive strategy but they continue to relapse? Peter. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that is the reason why we said that um, um, It's a coded disease, relapsed brain disease, relapsing brain disease. 
And that's what we refer to as a, a substance use disorder or a chronic. And when patient has gone through a comprehensive uh, uh, treatment and the patient is still relapsing, then there's need for us to look at, we'll go back again to drone board and also look at, okay, why is this patient relapsed? There may be a lot of factors. One, the patient might be jobless. They may, the patient may not have some social support, you know, strong social support, support at home. You know, the community might be hostile and there may be a lot of challenges of life that this patient might be, might be, uh, be facing. So this man uh, meditates against him recovery, in, 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 to recover. Whereas instead of him to get to recover, because he couldn't face all those life challenges. And because there are a lot of things that he, he, he has not been able to, you know, to do on his own, then that may likely be relapsed. You know, when you talk, talk about triggers, we can look at it from two points of view. We can look at internal trigger, we can look at external trigger. But the fact that patient has gone through a comprehensive um, and treatment doesn't mean that if, if it has anything that has to do with external trigger, okay, passing by where they are selling or see friends they are using or going to a party or doing whatever. Those are the external things that can also precipitate patients, you know, to go back into substance use. And that's why we say relapse. But before it gets to relapse, we have lapse. Lapse is just like, oh, you have abstained for a long time, oh, before you know it, the patient is back, you know. And relapse is when you now use it as a full time, doing it all and all over again. That's what we can refer as relapse. So relapse is something that we should not see as, uh, as a taboo in recovery. It's part of recovery itself. When a patient relapses, it, it enables us to go back to brain block to look at where are the necessary areas that we need to tidy up properly. So we should not see relapse as a kind of ah, yeah, has gone through a comprehensive thing. Why is it? Why? Why is it? Why, why is it that this patient has now relapsed? So relapse is even part of recovery too. It's part of coming back again to redefine it, to reshape it, and to restructure it again, so that the patient can also benefit well. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Martin. Any uh, contribution on that or comments on that in relation to that question? No, no, no contribution at all. Yes, we we'll proceed. Thank you. Okay, the next yes, question. Yeah. yeah, the next question is um, Will it be beneficial for the family or somebody who went to treatment to relocate, especially if the drug in friends and social drugs are in their neighborhood? So the question again is, will it be beneficial for the family of somebody who went to treatment for that person to relocate, especially if the friends are involved in drugs and the sources of drugs are within their neighborhood? That's the next question for you, Peter. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. Um, yes, I would say yes. If they have that kind of opportunity to relocate to another conducive um, shelter or conducive environment i will say yes if they have but unfortunately in rural areas in urban areas and everywhere there is drugs everywhere so relocating might be advantage at the same time might not even be useful at times but let me look at it from the positive point of view if you have a friend in a neighborhood and they are using drugs and you don't have that good power you know to say no to them or you can't resist your friends because you want to belong you want to be among them you want to do what they are doing and um, because of that you find yourself in this kind of situation then you can relocate to another new environment whereby you are going to be well engaged doing something positive and which also is going to lead to recovery and care and support from the family members so it's, it's, a, it's a good thing if family members can relocate but looking at what is happening in our society how many people can afford to live where you are staying, probably you, you have built your own house there, that place belongs to you, is your own house. You now say because your child is using it, you can relocate to another new place, or you want to go and build another house elsewhere, or you want to go and get an apartment elsewhere. So we can see these are the challenges, but, but, but it's also good if the patient or the client can relocate, it's okay. But if the patient cannot, then that's not the end of the world. The patient can still learn some coping strategy Looking at some Irish situation, how do I manage some Irish situation? Imagine an Irish situation to enable the patient to be able to cope. And that's why I talk about trigger. Trigger comes from thoughts, something small 
will come into the mind of the patients. Oh, I'm bored. What do I do now? <laughs> let me go and meet my friend and let me spend some time with him. Well, the great the friend is using drugs. When he goes to your friend's place, he probably knows, ah, how are you? It's a long time. How have you been doing? I've not seen you. Oh, I went for rehab. Ah, rehab. Okay. You are now back. I'm back. Hmm. Do you mind joining me? I have some things to smoke. Or the pay, even if the friend is smoking. I mean, then it's like my trigger him also says, okay, let me just have a puff. From a puff, or even they call it kiss. From a kiss, before you know it, they start, you know, taking, and before you know it, you will now find um, his friend's place as a, a an abode. You know, but if the patient can relocate to another place, I think that will also help in recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, um, for that answer. Martin, any comments on that? I, I agree absolutely with uh, Peter. Uh, relocating is an option, but it also has uh, challenges. So all of this needs to be put into consideration. Thank you, Peter. Okay, thank you, Martin, for that. We'll move on to the next question. The next question I have here is, what do you do if families themselves are stigmatizing the person with substance use disorder? So the question is, what do you do if families themselves are stigmatizing the person with substance use disorder? Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, what we do is, at the intake, we let them realize that um, the treatment format is triadic. It's going to involve the relation, it's going to involve the patient, it's going to involve the therapist. So make them to understand that at, initial, at, at intake level. And when the relations are more or less like uh, stigmatizing the patient, you know, it's because of what they have experienced, the body of care. So we can't blame all this relation as well because the body is too much on them. And some of them are looking for a way to escape. So when they're able to bring the patient to the hospital, we psychoeducate them that the stigma is something that we are just looking at is thing. But at the same time, you just have to look a way out. You can't stay in there. But the fact that yeah, you, you abuse your child uh, because he has been using drugs, he has been fallen by friends, doesn't mean that you have to kill that child. The child has a disease that needs to be treated. So once they look at it as a disease model, it will also help them for them to know that, yes, just like when someone has diabetes or having malaria or whatever. So this patient is also having a disease. So why can't he also undergo better treatment? So with that, by the time we also let them know, the, the stigma will be reducing. They also will look at it from other point of view because we believe they don't know. And there is a, is a duty to educate them for them to know that this is the best way going about it. So instead of going home with that stigma, whatever they are having in their minds, we will have to able to exchange them and you know, change their mind and educate them, give them some vital and important information that they will take home about recovery and treatment. So with that, we can change the mind of the family members who have this kind of uh, 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 stigma or have this kind of, um, uh, how will I put it now, that this patient cannot do well, that kind of, you know. But once we psychoeducate them and we able to, they're able to know the best way to help their, their, their patients. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Martin, do you have anything to add to what Peter's just shared in relation to that question? No, 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 that is fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah. Move on to the next question, because um, we have a lot coming through. So the next question I have here is um, it's a comment and a question from one of the participants. The comment and the question is, I agree 100% that involvement of parents in the recovery journey of a client with substance use disorder is highly beneficial. But where you find yourself in a community which believes that addiction is an evil curse with evil consequences, how can this um, client be helped? How can you help a client that finds itself in a community where addiction is seen to have that negative connotation of an evil curse with evil consequences? So I guess that links in well with what you described about monetization. But that's the question from the participant. Sorry, can, I, can, I, can you just take the question again, part of the comments? Oh, okay. So the question I have here is the 
the participant has said, you know, involvement of parents in the recovery journey of client is highly useful. But where you find yourself in a community which believes addiction is an evil curse with evil consequences. So there's that stigma of it being evil uh, and it's a curse. How can you um, help your client? How can the client be helped in this sort of scenario? All right. Um, that's a really side print my presentation. Uh, some people have this kind of idea that uh, this uh, addiction you know, or substance disorder is a moral thing or a character that can be changed or a weakness of character. You know? And um, some people also believe that it's an evil or they have been caused. So all these things, as Martin Navali said, is there's need for us to educate the, the public, the public about what substance use disorder is all about and way out. You know, it's a disease. So some people look at it from different angles, depends on different culture. You know, some people look at, ah, uh, uh, you know, even the stigma that's looking at it from a point that, ah, that house, that family, don't go there, don't go near them. Or that house, that family has been caused. Look at their lives, look at, because they are probably this dysfunctional family, you know? So what I can just say here is that we keep on encouraging people to speak out, to talk about some of those things that are evidence-based about prevention, treatment, and recovery. And stay away from all the things that might, you know, that might, that might not help in recovery by giving names, you know, and addicts, this and that. But by the time we educate the public, then the thing will be going gradually, gradually, gradually until it's spread around. Then everybody will be able to know that it's not a cause or evil thing, but it's more or less like it's a disease that can also be treated. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, Martin, do you have any comments on this? I know with ICIP Nigeria, you've been working with a whole load of, um, of members and maybe the issues you've come across as well in the work that you're doing. Great, I think uh, uh, the, the point uh, still boils down to the issue of perception. Uh, perception, uh, because uh, uh, if the perception is not right, and if uh, there is no change in perception, so it becomes uh, uh, difficult, you know, for for the society to understand what uh, substance use and substance use disorders are about, and how the scientific uh, uh, scientific understanding and how to even address it in the first place. So, if they believe that is that it is a cause or uh, uh, it is it is uh, uh, one form of uh, uh, you know it's a cost. Let me just summarize it that way. Then uh, it becomes difficult, you know, for the the, the, the patient to receive the appropriate uh, uh, attention because they will be addressing it, you know, through the negative uh, or what may not be um, uh, uh, effective. So that is why that perception, the change in perception is very important. I think I saw Nigerian chapter is, is, is working hard on this, on this to drive evidence-based uh, approach to substance use prevention management and so on. So gradually we believe that uh, at least the information we get uh, to the new Ukraine so that uh, at least um, uh, the right uh, attention or intervention will be provided for persons with substance use disorders. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Yeah, thank and you due to time, we have um, time for only one more question, which I'll present to you, Peter. And the question is, is it possible for government to regulate the fees charged by recovery facilities, especially um, private facilities? So is it possible for government to regulate the fees charged by recovery facilities? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, like I, let me tell you frankly here in, in our facility here, uh, I can say we are one of the best and um, the fee here is nothing to write about. Our patients or our clients are again the best that we can, we can, we can offer. In terms of price, in terms of fee is being reduced to the barest minima. Because if you compare what we do here in our, in, in, our, in our hospital here with what is happening in private sector, you see that there's a lot of gap. You know, where they're paying thousands, 
in the private settings, our own agency media, whereby the government is also trying to help our people. But we can still encourage our government to do more because we have a lot of patients or clients outside that cannot afford uh, these strict things, no matter how small it is. You know? But if the government comes around and then we also have some um, private sectors also coming around to dig a lot of things we really need here. I think we, 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 we can even be as free. Like for instance, now looking at the vaccine now we are taking this COVID-19 vaccine now. Now is free. So why can't they also look at mental illness or looking at substance use disorder like that? Let them pump money into mental health. Let them pump money into prevention. Let them pump money into treatment. Whereas we have and giving us money is not just going to be for the patient or even for the personnel be able to get trained in best evidence-based treatment form and prevention. So they can go to the public and also help. We also have some um, we also have some different centers like uh, health centers, you know, in the neighborhood. Let the government employ people, let them uh, restructure the place, let them put all the facilities that needed in place. Then we see that people will come around and express themselves. They pick up before you know it, it will be the reduction. And so we can also encourage our government to do more. But here in our facility, here, we are being addressed. And we thank the management for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for the excellent response. I'll now hand over the time to Martin to for and Peter. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Michael, and uh, thank you, Peter, for the uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I think we have been able to handle most of the questions, uh, except one that I can see here uh, that is talking about uh, a teacher uh, uh, who used a psychoactive uh, substance uh, who was uh, more or less uh, uh, relieved of appointment and abandoned. Uh, one thing uh, the public or even government functionaries may not understand is that uh, it, is, it is even more beneficial to address the needs of persons with substance use disorders than to abandon them or even terminating the appointment. Uh, this is part of what we, 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 we talk about uh, in workplace substance use prevention, management, and policy. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is more beneficial to manage persons with substance use disorders than to abandon because that abandonment has uh, 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 you know, repo effects because, of course, it affects it definitely to affect the family, it will even affect the children, uh, the children upkeep, and so many things. So, that so many things need to be put into consideration before that first uh, one line, you know, a policy of termination of appointment, even where cases of disorders may not have been established. So, all this boils down to uh, government policies and also the understanding. And perception of, uh, of people. Uh, for instance, why not, um, uh, just like Peter said, why not uh, health insurance for persons with substance use disorders or persons with uh, mental health uh, uh, issues? Because we, it, it, it is because of the perception still, they believe that uh, it's a moral failure. They decided to just go into using psychoactive substances but not seeing it from the other uh, uh, points of, uh, of, uh, of the scientific uh, uh, of biopsychosocial and so on, because the environment contributes, the, the uh, genetic vulnerability is an issue and so on. So the, the more all of this, uh, with the more the public and even the stakeholders, the government and others understand this, the, the, the better in terms of uh, addressing it and not see it as uh, as uh, because that is only when they can even help to bear the cost, you know, that is even when they can help to bear uh, the cost. So on this note, I want to once again thank uh, each and everyone uh, on behalf of uh, uh, the Board of Trustees of ISOP, Nigeria Chapter, the Executive Council and, uh, and, and members. We thank you for being part of this uh, presentation. To the speaker, we are most grateful for the excellent job. Uh, to Michael, thank you for joining me in moderating uh, this uh, session.
to the esteemed uh, participants. So we we'll say uh, thank you as we look forward to uh, another uh, session again, and that will be on the 20th of May, uh, 2021. Please keep the date, uh, of course, to, to, to join us in another beautiful session. And I want to assure you that uh, it will also be very uh, educative. And to everyone, I say thank you at this point. And to Olivia, who has been behind uh, uh, the screen, I'll say thank you for a job well done and all the support team of uh, ISO Global. To everyone, I say thank you until we see you again uh, on the 20th of uh, May 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.